We're in Joshua chapter 7 for the second time and in this chapter I expect for the last time, the Lord willing, we we will hopefully move on uh, next Sunday to chapter 8 but there is so much in this chapter that I didn't want to miss. I wonder, Steve, would you read the chapter for us? Yes, of course. Are you okay with that? The whole chapter. Yeah, nice and loud and clear, please. Yeah. The reading is from Joshua chapter 7. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achim, the son of Carmi, the son of Gabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took up the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Aven, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labour thither, for they are but few. So there went up thither of the people about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate even unto Shabarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide, he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we have been content and dwelt on the other side, Jordan? O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it, and shall environ us round, and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen, and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel, thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, ye shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come up households by households, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah, and he took the family of Zahites, and he brought the family of the Zahites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give 
I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and two hundred shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of fifty shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran unto the tent and behold, it was hid in his tent and the silver under it. And he took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and unto all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had and they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones, and burned them with fire, after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Echor unto this day. Thank you, Steve. <coughs> nice and loud and clear, thank you. I just want to make um, something's not in my notes, just a quick comment uh, about the death of Achan and his family. Um, the Lord had said that they should be burned. We read it earlier on. Um, But it's, it's important to point out that they were stoned to death and they were burned afterwards. They were not burned alive. Um, I mean, some would say a stoning is brutal, and perhaps it is, but I think being burned alive is far more brutal still. Mm. And, of course, that's gone on in this country back in the 1500s during the reign of Mary. Um, and, of course, before that, the Lollards were sorely persecuted by the likes of Henry IV, Henry V and others. So I just thought I'd mention that they were not burned alive, they were stoned, and after their deaths, then they were burned uh, in the Valley of Achor. Um, so this, we're going to be thinking, we thought last week about the sin of Achan, robbing God, and uh, we're going to look again at the sin of Achan, but this is part two, and just sort of filling in some of the gaps of some of the things that I think are important in this chapter Verse 1 says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. And yet we know it was only one man. So the question would arise, why then did God hold the whole nation responsible? And I have two lessons to draw from that, and the second one I will leave till we finish, because it's a precious lesson indeed. But the first lesson I draw from the fact that the children of Israel are uh, charged is this. You are not an island. I am not an island. If we are members of the body of Christ, and we are, all that you say and all that you do affects the body of Christ and brings honour or shame to the Lord and to his gospel. We are part of a body and we affect the body. And God has a great concern about that. If you want to look with me for a moment to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll see this. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where the Apostle Paul describes the unity of the church in the picture of the body of a man 1st Corinthians 12 and we'll start to read at verse 15 for as, for as the body is one and hath many members and all the members of that one body being many are one body so also is Christ 
For by one Spirit are we all baptised into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and having uh, having been all made to drink into one Spirit. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm now at verse 14 if you're trying to find me. <laughs> sorry about that. Verse 14. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him, and if they were all one member, where were the body? But now they are many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honourable, upon these we bestow more abundant honour. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. So we see there how that we are interconnected and we are interdependent uh, I think in the body of Christ as a whole of course but also as an individual assembly so that not one of us is an island my carelessness will affect you people and my zeal will bless you people and vice versa This illustrates then the, covet, the connectedness of believers, this, this passage of Paul here, and the obvious impact if one member fails in zeal or obedience. Now we all fail, we know we do, uh, but thank God there's abundance of grace. Where sin abounded, the Bible says, grace hath much more abounded or doth much more abound. And praise God for that. Praise God. We're not living in times like this where such sin would have caused stoning to death there is abundant grace we've been singing about earlier on uh, that Christ has taken our sins away and answered for us and praise God for that that we are fully and forever delivered from the sinners the sin that's in us and the sinners that we are and the sins that we've committed and shall commit let's go back to Joshua 7 then and look at verse 3 verse 3 and they returned to Joshua and said unto him, this is the spies, and returned to him and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labour thither, for they are but few. Two things I would notice out of this verse. Um, following a great victory, there's a great opportunity for error. One victory, says George Williams, should not encourage prayerless presumption. That's the first thing. Secondly, at Jericho, Joshua, following the command of the Lord, told the people what to do. And there was victory. Here at Ai, the men are telling Joshua, We are sure to err when we tell the Lord our plans instead of listening for his. And that's the great difference. God had told Joshua, strange, this strange proceeding by which Jericho fell. But now we find the men, the, the spies are telling Joshua what they should do to take Ai. Oh, there's an overconfidence because of the previous victory. And it doesn't seem to be that there's a looking to the Lord as there should have been. We should be very careful not to run ahead of the Lord. Uh, the more we commit even our smallest plans to God's will, the more we shall prosper. Too often things fail and things don't work that we might have committed to the Lord, but we didn't. In little things sometimes, we think the little things are unimportant, and yet, and then we go about them and they don't work. Uh, had we prayed perhaps about it, we might have seen some success. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 6. I can just get the pages apart. Proverbs 3 and verse 6. Trust, sorry, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. 
In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Learn to see God's hand in our affairs. Acknowledge his hand in our affairs. Acknowledge his interest in our affairs. And uh, he shall bring it to pass. Verse 6 of Joshua 7. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the even tide. He and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. There are times when even prayer is incorrect. If God shows us what we must put right, there's nothing to pray about except perhaps to ask for strength and grace to do so. <coughs> for example, a Christian girl maybe maybe not long in the faith, maybe long in the faith, meets an unbelieving man. She fancies, she thinks she's fallen in love with him, which is a strange phrase that I don't find in the Bible. But she thinks she's fallen in love with this man, so she goes to the pastor and she says, should I marry this man? We love each other. It's not a matter for prayer. God has said no, and so should the pastor. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Applies in all kinds of ways, but particularly applies to marriage. The answer is in the scripture, there's nothing to pray about. And so often people will pray about things that the Lord has clearly spoken about. Well, they'll go and ask the pastor, and the reason they go and ask the pastor is because they don't want God's answer. They're hoping the pastor might find a loophole in the word of God for them, maybe. Maybe. 